Good evening. I am Zemain Van of the Eventide, and tonight I welcome you to a vampire interview with Gail Z. Martin, who is not a vampire, but an author of vampire fiction, amongst many other things. Urban fantasy, horror, steampunk. Epic fantasy. All of the stuff. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So we are here to talk about vampires. I know you write about a lot of things that aren't vampires as well, but we're going to focus on vampires for tonight because that's what we do here. Mm -hmm. So first of all, why do you write about vampires? I blame it on Dark Shadows. I was a kid in the 60s and Dark Shadows was my absolutely favorite TV show. This was back when it was on TV uh, and it was a daily soap opera that happened to feature vampires and werewolves and witches and all this cool stuff. I was a preschooler. What my mother was thinking by letting a four and five year old watch oh this goodness. daily soap, I don't know. But uh, it, it's it's just one of my most indelible childhood memories. Were this vampire and this this painting that kept on that caught on fire and kept burning, and the, all the plot lines from the Barnabas Collins era, and the very first story that I ever sort of wrote. I couldn't spell yet, so I had to dictate it to my grandmother to write it down because I was five was about a vampire. Other kids used to get cardboard boxes and make them into race cars and boats and, and other things. I made mine into a coffin and rose <laughs> from it. I mean, this must have like totally creeped my mother out. That but is amazing. There is, there is just no doubt how I got set on this path. So when you write about vampires, what are you expressing? Is it just how cool they are? Is there anything deeper to it to you? Is it aesthetic? Is it intellectual? It's a combination of a lot of things. This whole idea about being burdened with immortality um, really hits me because while we all want to live nice, long, healthy lives, vampires are immortal. And that's cool in one sense in that, hey, you're, you're frozen at this peak in your life. And depending on the mythology, uh, you get to be like 35 forever. And isn't that cool until everybody you know and love starts to get old and die off and then the times change. And I guess my, my connection with this is there's a family story about my great grandfather who lived to be 95 back in, I guess it was the 1940s. That was a very old age. And he had outlived two wives. He had outlived several of his children. He had outlived all of his contemporaries. He had outlived his time. He no longer felt like he fit in. And though he was in good health, the family story is that he just decided he was done and went in his bedroom and laid down on his bed and died. And that brings the humanity with the vampires to me. I think there's also, we project a lot onto vampires because they are the classic outsiders. So I've read vampire stories where the vampires are clearly filling a role for an oppressed minority. I've read vam vampire stories where not only is there a homoerotic subtext between the characters, but again, you see this oppressed minority element, uh, except the, the prejudice is against the undead. Uh, but you're, you're seeing the same kind of things roll out. Mm -hmm. I think that there's also an element of how we deal with deep trauma in... Um, the vampire mythology because how do we describe someone who is really bereft, whether it's a personal trauma, whether it's, it's being victimized by something. We talk about feeling like my life ended, feeling like I'm walking around in a daze. I can't feel anything. Time doesn't mean anything. I lose track of time. I'm, I'm not so you enter alive into this anymore. like vampire this, state almost. This sense of being here but not really being alive. And and so I think we work through a lot of our issues with this vampire mythology. And I've seen authors do just a brilliant job coming at it from all of those angles, as well as, you know, the really sexy rich guy who will be 35 forever, except they never think but I won't. So, that, <laughs> so there's a complication built in well, right they from the think, start. He'll make me a vampire too, and then we'll both be sexy forever. All depends on how much you like your meat rare. So do your vampires tend to focus on that angle of dealing with trauma and 
that sort of thing, the grief. Most of my vampires are, are pretty, um, they've lived through a lot. I mean, if you've, if you've lived for several hundred years, I would think you'd have a burden of grief just from, imagine seeing all the tumult you see in a single life. That might include world wars or depressions, the stock market going up and down, all of the angst around you. Now imagine that you're on the sixth or seventh lifetime of seeing this. You know, I was a history major. We repeat this stuff over and over again, and we never seem to learn from our mistakes, or at least we don't seem to learn for very long. It's a tragic sense. Yes, because you're, the stupid never gets any less. <laughs> that people are still blowing each other up. People are still making the same mistakes. They're not willing to learn. And you see this. And I would think that the longer you were a vampire, you'd really have to fight that urge to just go off by yourself because you can't handle it anymore. Aside from the fact that everybody you like dies off with what feels like to you the lifespan of a pet dog. I mean, think how much we hurt when we lose a pet. And we only have a pet for, I mean, unless you have a parrot or a chinchilla or something, 10 years, 15 years if we're lucky. Now imagine if the people in our life dropped off in that same kind of time frame. You just get attached to them. They're really part of the family. And now they're gone. And it's been the blink of an eye. So I think that vampires, if they've, un unless they are sociopathic, and I think that is a reaction to this, is to just say, I'm not caring about anybody but myself. Shut down emotionally. Just shut down emotionally. Or you really have to be brave to continue to re-engage. So these very long-lived vampires versus a lot of vampires we see where they exist as sort of cannon fodder for heroes to beat up and destroy and they've only been a vampire for a week or something. Do you find that there's much more meaning in that for the immortality aspect versus the superhero sort of aspect? My vampires that get a lot of screen time, so to speak, tend to have made that choice to stay engaged. And that doesn't mean that they're having a romance with anybody. In fact, in my Deadly Curiosities urban fantasy series, Soren, who's the nearly 600-year-old vampire who used to be the best jewel thief in Antwerp, now he is a leader in a coalition of mortals and immortals that eliminate supernatural threats and get cursed and haunted objects out of the wrong hands. So he has a purpose to keep him going. He has a purpose, and even though he looks like he's a grad student, he almost takes a grandfatherly approach to the main characters in the book who are in their mid-twenties because he's their business partner in this antique shop that, that's really kind of a front for getting these dangerous objects out of the way. But he tells Cassidy that he had his last, he, first of all, he's not interested in her at all, and he never will be. Um, they don't have that kind of relationship. But he tells her at one point that his, the last time he allowed himself to fall in love with a mortal was 70 years ago, and he's never doing it again. And in Vendetta, we see how that plays out, and we understand why. And so he's, he's made a choice to cut that part of, of his relationships off because it's just too hard on him. He's got this purpose, this reason to live, uh, this occupation, mm -hmm. as it were, and it's a good occupation. He's making the world a better place, mm -hmm. sensibly. For him to decide to do that versus a vampire who decides, I have no reason, I'm just going to shut down and shut off and shut out the world. Is there a morality tale in there? Is there a right versus wrong way to live? I know a lot of vampire stories deal with what is the meaning of life? Why do I exist? Why do I have this immortality? Why have I been cursed? So finding a job, as it were, that has a sense of right or wrong to it, does that factor in? Most of my vampires usually have a purpose. If they're on the good side, it's, it's trying to save the world. It's, it's bringing their extra abilities, their immortality, their, the fact that they're tough to kill to the side of the good guys. If they're the opponent, then it's because they've decided, screw all of you, I'm leaving with the most toys. I want the power, I'm, I'm gonna be here and you're all dust. Or saying, I wanna be the power behind the throne so nobody can ever come after me. And so I think mine have all had purpose. In the epic fantasy series, in my Chronicles of the Necromancer, you have the Vyash Maru, who are actually somewhat of an oppressed minority. Um, everybody knows about them. They're unwelcome in some of the kingdoms, welcome and protected in others, kind of on their own in some. And they 
they have a patron aspect of the sacred lady, um, Istra, the dark lady. And so that plays into a lot of the story. But again, with immortality, you have a choice. What am I going to do with this? Am I just going to be out for myself? Or am I going to try to do something that actually matters? Because someday, nobody is truly immortal permanently. Someday I won't be here. What legacy do I want to leave? In the Ascending Kingdoms, you definitely have that setup between people who want to see, who, who see a value in maintaining civilization and using their talents to keep order, as opposed to someone who says, I'm just going to leave the bank because I can. And, and those are my, my Talishte, are the, the vampires in that series. In the Darkhurst series, which is the new epic fantasy series with Scourge, and then upcoming is, is Vengeance, we don't see a whole lot of the vampires yet in that series. They've retreated into this ancient forest. And as long as you don't go into the forest, they don't come out after you. And they're the Sanguinaries, or the Gwyns for short. But they do get pulled in in a key battle because they look at it and say, what's more important, our privacy or making sure that this other big hazard doesn't happen? So they're like the Ents. Sort of. You have to make a good case for them. And they aren't going to just dodge in on anything. But this, this threat threatens them as well. Mm -hmm. And so they will play the game this one time. But don't come back into the forest after we're done. So in each of your series, you mentioned your vampires have a different name. Mm -hmm. They're essentially vampires, but they're different types or sorts. Mm -hmm. or, uh, are you familiar with the are vampires are different trope? Somewhat, yeah. It's, it's a trope in that it gets overdone sometimes where an author will be like, well, I have to make my vampires so different so no one's going to accuse me of them being just like Dracula or just like Twilight or something. But it sounds like you've got a little bit of different going on with yourself mm -hmm. as well. Is there something in each series that motivates a different angle you're approaching and any sort of deeper meaning to that for the metaphors that the vampires stand for? It isn't necessarily that their vampirism works differently. I just wanted people to not go, vampire, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted them to think about what these characters were doing and why they were doing it. It's the place they fit in the world. Like, you could have the exact same vampire in a different world-building setting, and it could mean something different. Yeah. I mean, mine stick very close to the classic vampire behavior. They can't go out at night. All of my epic fantasy series are set in worlds other than our own, so none of the Christian symbolism matters insofar as showing them a cross, what's that? Um, using holly to stake them, that only mattered if it was a piece of, you know, the true cross or something. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of those things, you kind of have to think holy water doesn't exist. So you have to think through what then are your tools against them, because none of this, this Christian mythology exists. Are there special religious or uh, magical tools that work on your vampires that you've created? There are, and they're, they're usually coming out of how the magic system works, because each of my series have a very different magic system. So mm -hmm. I'd say my magic systems are much more different than my vampires. Sure. Now, in Deadly Curiosities, that is set in modern-day Charleston, South Carolina. And Soren explains that it's not that silver will kill him. It just gives him a very irritating rash. But it's not because it's a religious symbol. So he can go into a church. Ironically, the only thing he can't do is receive the sanctified wine. So for a blood drinker, the only one who, the only blood he can't consume is the, the blood of the Eucharist. But everything else, he can walk into a church, he's not going to catch on fire. Um, is the origin of vampires in that modern day set universe connected to Christianity at all or completely separate from it? I haven't really delved into where they come from. I really take the sense that they are part of the natural world. They're just a rare part of mm -hmm. it. And as with any predator-prey balance, as long as one doesn't get out of hand, nature maintains a balance. But you've got sentient creatures, and that plays a big role with the Darkhurst series because it's about medieval monster hunters. And yet the, the Gwyns are not monsters. They're sentient creatures that are predators, and humans are not the apex predator. But that doesn't make them monsters any more than it makes a timber wolf or a black bear a monster. It's just they can eat us if they choose to. 
And humans are the only species capable of conceptualizing monsters in the first place. So. And we get bent out of shape if somebody ever points out to us that we're not the apex predator. So, I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to vampire fiction, and we've seen a lot of vampire fiction mm-hmm. in recent years, I mean, for centuries, but it kind of has ballooned. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you like to see for the future of vampires? Something maybe new or original or different? Not necessarily something you plan to write mm-hmm. or you're the author to write, but something you'd like to see appear in our world of vampires? I like to see them dealing with the aftermath of immortality. Mm. And if they aren't dealing with it, then let's deal with their sociopathy because they should be dealing with some of these issues. I guess a lot of vampire fiction recently has about been vampires in the moment. They may mm-hmm. be old, but they're still dealing with the moment. The teenage girls, they're wooing for some reason. Yeah, and um, because that's not creepy at all. So something about the, the psychology of what it will do to a human brain as it ages or a immortal creature's brain if, if they were never human. Or the perspective. Just the perspective. I mean, as you move through life, you, you see things very differently in your 20s than you did, you know, when you were a teenager or a tween. That changes every decade. I'm fascinated by where would you be if you were even reasonably psychologically healthy in a hundred years? If you didn't have the body physically degrading, what would your perspective be like? Because I know at this point, you know, I'm a mom, I have three kids who are 18 and up. I see things a whole lot differently. And that's, that's part of my ability as a mom to go, chill, I know this seems like the biggest deal in the world to you at this age, and it is important, but it will be okay. And I know that because of life experience, where I can look at things now and say, that's really not worth getting upset about where I would have been hot and bothered, you know, when I was 25. So for the percentage of vampires who don't become ravening monsters, what's their perspective like? Do they get philosophical? Do they go out and lead yoga retreats? Do they, how do they see the world? And how then do they square that with being part of that world? So when a human becomes a vampire, they become immortal, they have this immortality to Mm -hmm. look forward to. But they also have to hurt people to survive. And a lot of vampires have this tortured experience of, I have to drink blood, I'm a monster, or maybe I even have to kill Mm -hmm. in order to survive that blood drinking. Do you explore that in your vampires at all? Or are your vampires able to survive without harming people generally? I think it depends, again, on how you set up the mythology. Um, If you look at a lot of the traditional vampire lore, not all vampires had to kill. In fact, it's very much a part of the lore that a vampire could visit numerous times and only take sips. Mm -hmm. And that was part of being preyed upon, was that it was maybe a slow-wasting disease as opposed to just, you're dead. That's why they call consumption. Yes. I think depending on how you set it up, my vampires that have chosen to work with mortals and be the good guys, so to speak, don't have to kill. They can work with willing donors in a pinch. They can waylay somebody in an alley and take them down a pint, but not seriously hurt them. But the ones who have not chosen to live peaceably among mortals really get off on the pain and the, the, um, the killing and the bloodletting. And to me, that doesn't seem that out of, uh, that difficult to believe. Because we I mean, have humans who a, kind of go that way. You give way. a human some kind of unprecedented power, and most of them don't their do dark, too well. Darkest with it. side will come through. Yeah, and you know, absolute power and all that. So I think it, it partly partly depends on how you set up the mythology, but it also depends on where you want the characters to go. So you mentioned a few classic vampire lures that you like: Dark Shadows, Anne Rice. Is there anything current that's on TV or in movies or in books that you're reading that you like particularly? I'm a huge Supernatural fan, which anybody who follows me on Twitter at Gail Z. Martin knows. And most of the time in that series, the vampires are the bad guys. Um, there have been a few that said, look, I don't want to eat any people. Just let me go and I won't cause any trouble. So the way Supernatural portrays vampires, are you good with that? Or do you wish they could do it better in a way that's more meaningful? I want to call it shallow, but it's a little lighter, vampire light, oh, yeah. as far as um, deep metaphors and symbolism go. But but it's a monster of the week show. Mm-hmm. 
as, when it's not tackling the apocalypse and, and sure. other things like that. So that's where the monsters fit in that world building. Although you do have some, like I said, who said, hey, let us go. Lenore and her clan said, we won't bother anybody. And Show that the boys monsters did. can have depth. And that's one of the growth points through the series is that Sam and then later Dean come to realize, in Sam's words, it's not what you are, it's what you do. And Sam had to wrestle with that personally, with all of his own you know, issues with the demon blood and all that. Dean's come to it a lot later, but we're seeing now in, in season 13 with his acceptance of Jack the Nephilim that there's a lot of growing up that's happened. And over the years, there's been more gray and Dean's finally come to accept that. I think that's a very big growth piece, um, especially with some of his missteps in the past. So using vampires and monsters in general as a way to help a human protagonist evolve and become more human mm -hmm. is an interesting... Well, yeah, and that's one of the things that's happened with, with Supernatural in particular. Dean was very much in the, it's not natural, it's got to be evil. And that not only screwed up his relationship with Sam, pretty much brought on the apocalypse from his standpoint, but it, it led him to do things like kill the Kitsune that really might not have been truly a monster. She was protecting her kid. Mm -hmm. Well, what parent wouldn't kill to protect their kid? That doesn't, I mean, that works when you're human. So, you know, why wouldn't it work for somebody else? And he was making a lot of knee-jerk assumptions there. And we've seen him grow out of that. And so, yeah, the monsters actually have led to human character growth there. And I think that's a fascinating thread they've explored. So aside from Barnabas Collins, do you have any favorite vampire characters? I did love Lestat. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's just hard not to. He's the best. And Armand. Armand was pretty cool. Um, evil twerp. Evil twerp, but Antonio Banderas, really. <laughs> <laughs> Boy. There are just so many. Um, and I know when most people think of, of Dark Shadows, hopefully they think of the, the old 1960s uh, soap opera. They Jonathan don't think Fridge. of the Johnny Depp movie, which yeah. was just terrible. Um, but there was the very short-lived remake series in the early 1990s with Ben Cross. And he was really doing a good job, I think, as Barnabas Collins, but it, it only lasted for maybe, you know, 10 episodes. Um, it had... A very low budget, so they set, they shot all of their night scenes in the day, and you can tell because they have these huge shadows, and somebody stuck a blue filter over the camera. Um, the but, dark shadows. Yeah, they had a lot of them. <laughs> uh, but that notwithstanding, you know, that, that was a good remake. There's a lot of stuff, again, I'd like to watch and read. Um, I'm just so far behind on my to-be-read pile. It's because my to-be-written pile is <laughs> <laughs> kind of growing. Do you have any favorite female vampires? I was fascinated by Claudia in, um, in Anne Rice's series. Just the whole, well, that sure explains why you don't turn kids into vampires. And that sense of being an old soul in a young body. Um, very young body. Very young body. And I, I could kind of relate on that because when I was in grade school, there was another little girl in my um, first and second grade classes. And she had, uh, I'm really not sure what the condition was, but it had severely stunted her growth. And she was on a lot of medication for it. And so she was much, much older by a couple of years than we were until she wasn't so fragile that they couldn't even let her go to school. So here we were in first and second grade being maybe five, six, seven, and she was already eight or nine, but she was shorter than most of us. And she passed away when I was in second grade. I've always thought of Jan when I think about Claudia, because she had gone through things that the rest of us just couldn't comprehend with the hospital visits and the, the illness and the medicine. And here she was with a bunch of us little kids who were clueless about anything except, you know, our favorite cartoon show. And that's always given me a lot of sympathy for Claudia because we just had no idea. And there she was so different. And as much as everybody tried not to treat her differently, she was so fragile we had to. And how that must have felt for her. Claudia, of course, isn't fragile, but she never gets to grow up. And people treat her like a little kid when they see her. 
Yeah. And and she's an old soul in in a permanently stunted body. And as she had a child's brain that never really developed the levels of empathy or human understanding mm-hmm. that people get as they age probably isn't capable of that. She was more monstrous than the adult vampires in some ways, despite being so sympathetic. Yeah, because, you know, you, you don't get the frontal lobe until you're in your mid-20s now, they say. Um, and that governs a lot of that impetuous um, impulse control, which explains a lot when you look back on your teenage years. It's like, well, yeah, okay, I blame it on brain wiring. That's why I was such a pretentious jerk. <laughs> That's why all those things happen. But you're right, you know, the dark side to childhood is that kids don't have those filters. They don't have that self-control. They don't necessarily look ahead to think about consequences. And if they have been badly treated or abused themselves, they can sometimes turn that right around and take it out on other people. And we've we've seen cases in the real world where children have done truly monstrous things. And the process of becoming a vampire is a traumatic experience mm-hmm. that will probably mess someone up regardless of their age, but yeah. especially at a childhood age. Yeah, and then there are all the, the issues of dependence and codependence. So, yeah, I've, I've always thought Claudia was just really a fascinating character. I love those books. Yeah. Is there any author of new vampire fiction who's maybe not as recognized who you think deserves more credit? I think, well, I don't, these aren't new vampire books, but they really deserve more visibility than they ever got. And that's Karen E. Taylor's uh, vampire series. And to an extent, Tanya Huff's vampire series. They were early. They were just a hair ahead of Anne Rice. And so... Anne Rice and and then, you know, Laurel K. Hamilton came in and all of a sudden vampires were big news. And Karen and Tanya had written their books just a couple of years too early and they didn't quite catch the same degree of wave that, you know, Laurel and and Charlene and uh, Anne Rice did. So these are mid-70s? These are more like mid to late 70s. Uh, maybe early 80s? Because Interview with the Vampire was 1976, but of course it didn't really pick up steam until the movie came out Yeah, in the 90s. Yeah, I would say Karen's especially came out early 70s. Um, and it was just, it did well, but it never got quite the rise that I think it deserved because they're really excellent books. And I've, I've been on panels with Tanya Huff who said, you know, I was just a year or two too early to catch the crest. Um, you know, and unfortunately, sometimes when those crests come, sometimes they go back and, and sweep some of the backlist yeah, People with say, it. what else is out there? Oh, she's been around for a couple of years, but she didn't have that luck. And, and I think, you know, certainly both of them are, are best-selling authors. But compared to the titanic sales of things like Interview with the Vampire and the Anita Blake series and the Sookie Stackhouse series, I don't know that they ever got quite that level of fame. And, and they deserve it. The books are good. So... We've talked a lot about vampires, but you also write things that are not vampires. So would you like <laughs> not to talk much. About that? <laughs> well, there's vampires in everything, but some things are bigger than the vampires. Hopefully everything's bigger than the vampires because it's the magic to me that that builds the world. So I've built different magic. Magic works differently in all of my series. And so the, the magic underwrites the world, the, the gods and goddesses and that whole cosmology um, is different in each world. And then the rest of the world building and the plot and the characters kind of hang off that framework. So if you change those fundamental things with the way the magic works and the cosmology, not only are your mortals going to be different, but your immortals are going to be different as well. So what have you got coming out recently? Uh, a lot. <laughs> We've been pretty busy. The newest thing is the Spell, Salt, and Steel series, and this is Modern Monster Hunters. It's Mark Boychick, uh, Monster Hunter up in the wilds of western Pennsylvania. Uh, this is a snarky, funny, comedic horror uh, series that is uh, short. Each each book is about 100 pages, so it's, it's bite-sized. And uh, it's a loose tie-in to John Hartness's Bubba the Monster Hunter series, the second book. Um, it, open season is uh, just about to come out and this is one that I co-write with my husband Larry Ann Martin. Deadly Curiosities series and this is the urban fantasy series set in modern-day Charleston, South Carolina. 
We have two novels out with it right now. Uh, I'm working on Tangled Web, which is the third novel, and that'll be out later this year. Um, and actually. these are the ones that feature the vampire Soren that you mentioned. Yes, the 600-year-old former former jewel thief. And then we've been doing short stories set in the world of the Deadly Curiosities uh, books, kind of like extra episodes. And this is the second collection of short stories that we've just brought out. This came out in January. So it's short stories and novellas that happen in and around and between the books. You don't necessarily have to read them or the books in any order, but it fleshes out the world. And if you've read the books, you'll get more of a sense of some of the secondary characters in, in this book. And then, of course, Vengeance, which is the second book in the Darkhurst series, that's the medieval monster hunters, uh, that's coming out in April. And then we have some new series and, and more in the works, so there's just plenty of stuff coming up. We keep busy. So where can people find you on the internet and in the real world? I'm pretty findable. Um, you can go to the website at gailzmartin.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter at gailzmartin. Uh, I'm on Pinterest at gzmartin. You can see a pattern emerging here. Uh, keep it simple. <laughs> keep it simple. Facebook as Gail Z. Martin and the fan page is The Winter Kingdoms. But you can find the books certainly on Amazon, on Kindle, Kobo, and Nook, in ebook and print. And then um, most of the series are in bookstores everywhere. So uh, I, I'm pretty findable and I do 15 plus conventions a year. And I would just love to have you come up and say hi. What's coming up next? Next we have, uh, I'm doing Coastal Magic, which is an urban fantasy um, conference in Daytona Beach at the end of February. Oh. And then in March, I'm uh, a guest author at the Arizona Renaissance Festival. And in April, there's uh, RavenCon in Williamsburg. So lots of good stuff coming up. Well, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you joining me. Thank you for having me. Talking about vampires <laughs> in my lair. It's a very nice lair. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. So I hope you enjoyed this vampire interview. Maybe I'll be able to do more in the future if I can convince more unsuspecting vampire experts to join me in my lair. It's nice to have friends. Remember to like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the alert bell, make sure your alerts are updated, adjust your YouTube notifications to show most recent videos, not what it thinks is best for you because YouTube's doing that now. Thank you so much to my Patreon patrons. You make this show 100% possible. It would not exist without your support. And thank you especially this week to this Patreon patron, Alex Corvach, who has a video series about how to learn Romanian in an unconventional, awesome way. So if you've ever been interested in the Romanian language, check out his videos. They're pretty cool. Thank you. Good night.